Do you want to just kind of introduce yourself to uh, to our viewers here, like who we are and, and why we're here tonight? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Mark Corvin. I'm a composer for for film, and my prop the projects that I'm probably most well known for um, would be uh, Cube, which is a science fiction film from back in the in the late '90s. Uh, sort of a sci-fi horror, and of course, uh, witch as well. So I, yeah, I noticed that you worked on Cube. That's actually like a big favorite of mine. Cool. Um, so that have you? Did you kind of start out in Canada? Because that was a Canadian production too, right? Do you are you mainly focused in Canada? Yeah. I, well, I live in Toronto, and that's that's a Toronto film. So yes. Yeah. Um, how did you? What was your experience like on that film? Um, I, th I think that that's actually a pretty big cult uh, cult hit in the U.S. with yeah, horror, with horror yeah. fans anyway. I think. Well, actually, the the it was mostly a cult favorite of uh, in in Japan and France, huh? Because it was released in Canada and the U.S. and really didn't do anything, and then it hit France and it just went it went through the roof, and same thing with J Japan. So you never know who it's going to resonate with. Yeah. And because of that, it became uh, a cult film that uh, that became sort of an underground success in the in the states as well. Sure. Um, so you know, we're talking here. It's been a few weeks since The Witch was released, um, and it actually has done pretty well. I mean, considering it was this kind of little tiny indie film that made the festival circuit, ended up going kind of wide release. I'm always curious to kind of get if if you have any kind of feeling as to how you guys are feeling about how it's done. You know what I mean? Like it's performance because um, it's easy for people to kind of play armchair quarterback and say, oh, this film did this. But are you guys kind of happy with how it's been in theaters? Well, absolutely, because uh, the budget of the film was somewhere around a million dollars. Right. And last I checked, it's sitting around eight million uh, in the box office. So that's that's pretty good. So we're, we're very happy with that. And of course, the uh, the critical response has been over the moon which is fantastic, and the audience response has been, uh, shall we say, polarized. I think people that go to see The Witch that are expecting, uh, you know, The Conjuring or Saw or something like that, something that's going to be really horrifying and scary, um, often don't get their expectations met. Uh, this is probably more in keeping with, uh, let's say, The Babadook or It Follows, where it's not what people are really expecting yeah um, how, how do you so, guys feel about the american um you know ad campaign for it i don't know how much of that you guys saw but we sort of wondered aloud on our show if that played into some of the expectation game with people well i think i think it did uh you know you had a lot of um and i don't think it was just uh a a24 the uh the distributor um but also people like stephen king who were calling it uh right. you know scared the hell out of me i think he said uh, you know, then people are going to go and they're going to be, be expecting a film that will will do that. And for me, it, it it wasn't it wasn't a film that really scared the hell out of me. Uh, but I found I found it a like an amazing, awe-inspiring, beautiful film to watch, which a with a fantastic story. But it's not like something that scared the pants out of me. Well, I think when you say scared to to like an American wide audience, that that kind of no pun intended, it kind of conjures up a very specific, I think, like idea in their head. Um, and that's what's fascinating to me about the film is it's essentially like an art house film. Um, it totally is, yeah. And, it's you know, not it's, a jump scare movie. Right, at all, yeah. And I think that, that when you tell an American audience this is going to scare the crap out of you, I think that that's for you know better or worse kind of what they're expecting. But it's the interesting thing is like, you know, horror fans have really gotten behind this, but you've also had, and I think what led to the success is you had a lot of mainstream critics step in and say hey this is really really great you know what i mean so i think the the swath of kind of critical praise has been very interesting to me yeah um, yeah it's kind of been a long journey though right like how long have you guys been making the rounds with it you know sort of in festivals well it opened uh open at sundance uh i guess it would be uh i guess it was last january last february i think it was oh, okay interesting yeah, yeah. So, uh, so since then, they they did the festival run with it for for actually a very short time, and then they pulled it, and they were looking for just the right time to release it, and I, and I think they they nailed that that exact right time. 
was there a feeling with kind of everyone involved early on that you guys were working on something special or, you know, that this might have might be something that's seen by a wider audience at some point? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, I, I always knew it was something special. Like as soon as I read the script, I thought, wow, this is really cool. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the whole script is is uh, is written in Jacobian English. I thought that was a pretty radical thing for, for someone to do. And I found the story very compelling. And then when I met met Robert for the first time, I thought, this guy is really special. He's he's going to be around for a while. He's going to be, it's like meeting a young Ingmar Bergman or something like that. Hmm. You know, this guy's going to be around for a while and making some really cool movies. Uh, and I really wanted to be to be part of that and just hang on his coattails. Yeah. Um, so w- one of the questions, um, one of our writers thought of this question. I thought it was really interesting. Like, there was a lot made about how accurate the film was, you know, as far as the props and the sort of way they lived their lives and that sort of thing. Did it, did any of that kind of influence the, the sound of the film as well? Um, actually not, not really because the, um, Robert is the most meticulous person for detail that I've ever met. Like that film is just researched to the nth degree, you know, all the, you know, right down to the buttons on those clothes. I mean, it's all appropriate to, uh, you know, 1630, like right down the line. You, like the tools they used uh, to build those houses in the film were, were the tools they would have used at that, at that time because he didn't want to use modern tools to build the house. So it was, it was just ridiculous, the, the lengths that they went to to, to make it real for people. Um, the music was not like that. He specifically... Uh, told me that he did not want the music to sound uh, period. He did not want traditional Mm. melodies. He didn't want traditional harmony. Uh, He didn't want anything like that. He wanted an original score. But at a certain level, he wanted it to um, have sort of an aged sort of quality to it as well. So what it really came down to was the choice of instrumentation Uh, and and having the feel of, of earlier times uh, without it harkening back to any kind of a melodic or harmonic or stylistic thing of, of let's say, the early Baroque when the when the film was set. Sure. Uh, were there specific films that you sort of used as inspiration for the sound? Actually, no. I, I, I didn't uh, really research that at all on it quite purposely because I didn't want to be uh, influenced by, by other things because I was getting a lot of influence from, from Robert. So I didn't want to have other influences as well. You know, I really wanted to find uh, somewhat of my own voice in this as well. So I deliberately steered clear of that. Have people uh, told you that it reminds them of anything? Uh, I have my own uh, thoughts, but I'm curious before I, before I say it, if anyone's kind of said that to you. Well, yeah, actually a few people have mentioned uh, uh, the Leggetti piece from 2001 A Space Odyssey, mm-hmm. you know, where, where the monolith... Uh, on the moon, that whole sequence with the voices being very dissonant. And uh, that wasn't a deliberate, uh, anything deliberate, but I, when I h- listened to it now, I thought, well, yeah, that, that might have been uh, something I unconsciously copped. <laughs> so it actually, um, I mean, not di- not very direct, but it kind of felt like The Shining to me in, in certain places, um, just in the way that that is... Um, just this very like at, at times the score is almost assaulting you in that movie right it's just like so um just kind of in your face and the i don't know what it was there but i just went back and watched the trailer and even the trailer i was like man this reminds me of the shining uh, uh, uh no for me for me the shining wouldn't be uh, at all an influence on it because in fact i haven't seen the movie since it first came out oh wow, wow. so uh so i'm really not familiar with the <laughs> You should go back and listen. I'd be interested to see see what you yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Um, have you seen it all? Sort of. I, there's kind of some funny stuff going on on the internet with uh, Black Philip. Black Phillip's become a little bit of an internet uh, star in some ways. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you, you guy, you or anyone else that kind of involved in the film has been following any of that stuff at all. Uh, not not really, but but I have a fans my seem son... to have taken to him. I think. Pardon me. Fans seem to have taken to him as a as a character. That's cool. That's cool. You know, when I was doing a demo for the uh, the actual film, I had uh, I had my sons who are who are right by me here, sing the demo for the Black Philip uh, nursery rhyme. <laughs> yeah, I think that that scene with the nursery rhyme, we kind of all decided was one of the one of the creepiest scenes in the film. 
by far. Yeah, the kids kids singing nursery crimes. Uh, yeah. Sorry, nursery rhymes can be really creepy. Yeah, you know, just like the, that innocence of uh, you know the horror movie cliche of the music box. You know that that innocent childlike quality is a, is a real standard for horror movies. When you you know, I I assume I could be wrong, but I assume as a composer, you know, there's a point where you are seeing a cut. That's, you know, a rough cut has no music. I'm curious, like in that state, what stood out to you? And do you think that were there things that you felt, you know, with the right piece of music, we could really sort of elevate this moment? Well, I I, I have to uh, I have to correct you on that. Uh, As far as my experience, um, when I first started scoring films, that's what it was like when I got a rough cut. And even at the fine cut, I there'd be no music. But now virtually everything that's been submitted to me to score over the last seven, eight years, it all comes with music. Sort of like temp tracks? Yeah, temp, temp score. Huh. So you're always working around that. And The Witch was uh, certainly no exception to that. Um, now that can be a good or bad thing. Sometimes it's good if the, if the temp score is really, really great mm-hmm. and inspiring. That can be a good thing. And if the temp score is kind of kind of bad and not really inspiring, but you feel dragged in that direction anyway, that can be a bad thing. So it's very much a double-edged sword. Um, were there moments that you think the music sort of elevated in the film? You know what I mean? Like sometimes, sometimes I think, especially in horror films, you have moments that are just visually composed very, you know, in a frightening way, but the music just really kind of pushes them over the edge. Um, so can you run that question by me again? Uh, like, I, I guess maybe a better way to ask it is like, what are your sort of, as the composer, what were your favorite moments in the film to sort of bring to life? I, I'd say probably the, the first appearance of the witch. Yeah. And the witch's coven, I think were the, were the two favorites for me. Mm -hmm. And did you go see it in theaters when it came out? You know, I didn't, uh, although I did, I did fly down fly down to LA to, to catch the premiere there, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, cause that was the first time I saw it with an audience. So how, how was, was the audience? It was, the reaction was very, very interesting. You know, there'd be, there'd be gasps in places I didn't, for, uh, uh, I wasn't expecting mm-hmm. and there'd be titters in places I wasn't, wasn't expecting either. So it's, it's always a blast to, to watch it with a live audience. One of the, mo- the most interesting things to me when I saw it was that for probably the last half an hour, w- my theater was dead silent. And actually, like, m- multiple of us on the show had the same experience where people just seemed like they didn't even know how to react to what they were seeing, um, which, I, which I think is a really interesting aspect of the, of the film. Yeah, yeah. Um, its ability to sort of just, like, I think American audiences, too, that's the other really fascinating thing. It's just this is just not something they're used to seeing. Right, uh, right. Which, which is another really fascinating part of this film. Um, I've noticed, I was looking at your IMDb, that you've also done some sort of directing and some editing. Um, you know, I assume composing is what you mostly do. Is, is that something you're still pursuing or just kind of something you've done on the side, sort of doing those other roles? Well, it's kind of a hobby for me, actually. Uh, I find it a, an incredible challenge, uh, like directing like short films and things like that. Um, probably, probably the most useful thing uh, about it, though, is I get to to understand the people I'm working for a little bit better. Um, whereas before, before I started directing and uh, working in my, and writing my own short films, the director would show up in in my music studio, and I'd, I'd always feel like the last person uh, at the end, very end of the line. You know, sure, I was sure. the musician outside the whole process. But uh, but now when the director arrives and I just want to give the director a big hug because I have some inkling of what they go through um, in order in order to make this this film and I have like my respect for directors and writers has just gone through the roof. Um, I guess I'm I'm curious how did you get into sort of composing in the first place? I mean, did you have do you have like formal music training that sort of pushed you in that direction? I don't have a formal training really as a film composer at, at all. It was uh, actually quite a fluke. Hmm. Um, I grew up as a, as a rock and roll guitar player, and then I got into jazz, played jazz for, for quite a while, and then I, I got into uh, writing my own songs, being a, sort of a left-of-center 
um, singer songwriter, and I got signed to a record label out here in, in here in Toronto. And there was some. Uh, I was working on an album, and and uh, the producer for the album took the bed tracks and gave it to a director friend of his, and she edited w within the film and say, hey, I really like these these tracks. Maybe the, maybe he'll uh, compose for me. So it basically it was a complete fluke. I really didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> yeah. That's that's interesting. Um, do you have any other like horror projects sort of in the works, or is, is have you done? I mean, other than Cube, have you done a lot of other horror stuff? Uh, I haven't really. Um, it seems like uh, it would present its own sort of unique set of challenges when you're composing. Yeah, well, it's, it's it comes pretty natural to me, and and I think for a lot of a lot of composers, it's a, it's a really fun field to get into. Because there's not a lot of people slapping your hands saying don't do that because you can almost do do anything and being crazy and and as weird as as, as you want. Uh, right. So it's so it's a really fun uh, area to be in. I, I, I really like it. Uh, as far as things in the future, um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be working with Rob on some of his other projects because he has lots of things uh, lined up and and you know I feel like we're uh, we're a bit of a team now. So uh, cool. so yeah, that'd be wonderful to to tag along. Well, he definitely seems like a filmmaker to follow, especially I think if you if you like horror films. Um, it, do you have a sort of an online presence to you want you would want to give out like a Twitter or a you know a site or something? Um, sure, if people want to check out my site, uh, it's um, www.markcorven.com. M-E-R-K-K-O-R-V-E-N.com. Great. Well, well, thank you for joining.